Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our 11th annual Animal Law Symposium. My name is Miranda Gro, and I'm this year's symposium editor for Animal Law Review. I am so looking forward to an inspiring day filled with outstanding conversations on all things animal law. Um, first, we would like to begin by acknowledging uh, that our academic institution in the so-called Portland metro area rests on stolen traditional and ancestral indigenous homelands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other tribes of the Columbia River. Land acknowledgements are an imperfect process, but they are a reminder of our duty to recognize and support indigenous knowledge, creativity, and resilience, including fighting for reparations and the land back movement. Centering our work for non-human animal advocacy in this greater context of social injustice is a vital component of ensuring that our movement is in solidarity with broader social justice movements overall. Uh, just a couple of administrative notes as we move through the event, just know that all attendees, cameras and sound will be off throughout the event. Um, the chat function is also turned off. However, you may use the Q&A function down below to submit any questions uh, and they, we will answer those at the end of each event as we go through the day. So now it is my distinct honor to introduce Dean Jennifer Johnson. Uh, she is the Dean of our law school here at Lewis and Clark, and we are so lucky to have her and the school's support behind us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dean Johnson. Thank you, Miranda. I think I've got this unmuted properly. <clears throat> As Miranda said, um, I'm the Dean of our law school, and it's my pleasure to wel welcome everyone to Lewis and Clark and the Animal Law Symposium. From its beginnings, our Animal Law Review was a student publication. And over 25 years ago, and I was here on our faculty, our students came to us with this novel idea of publishing a law journal devoted solely to animal rights. And, and remember back then, most of us had never heard of a field of legal study devoted to animals. Although many of us owned and loved animals and a few of us, like me, even illegally brought them to work. The idea of a separate animal law field, nonetheless a new journal in animal law seemed illogical and we as a faculty did not get it. But fortunately our students did. And over the years we've had extraordinary students creating and editing important pieces of scholarship that have influenced animal protection advocacy and policy both in the United States and abroad. I am so proud of this journal and our students and all they've accomplished. And I look forward to see what innovative and important work the journal does in the future. Um, I wanna congratulate uh, the editors in chief this year, uh, Ron uh, Hyatt and Cindy Lunt, and, and of course our symposium editor, Miranda Groh and, and the rest of the staff on the Animal Law Review. And I also wanna thank the Animal Legal Defense Fund that supported this journal since its beginnings and supports this event today. We have a great group of speakers on the agenda. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Miranda. Thank you so much, Dean Johnson. Uh, now it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker of the day who will uh, enter in with some welcome remarks, uh, Professor Joyce Tischler. Um, we are very lucky to have Professor Tischler here at Lewis and Clark Law School. She joined as a professor of practice in May 2019 and previously served as adjunct faculty professor at Lewis and Clark since 2011. Uh, she also taught as adjunct faculty at University of California Davis, John Marshall Law School, and John F. Kennedy Law School, and has lectured at law schools throughout the US. Professor Tischler is affectionately referred to as the mother of animal law. She has been a trailblazer in the field of animal law for more than 40 years and has dedicated her career to improving the lives of animals through the legal system. She is internationally recognized for her work and speaks across the globe on issues germane to animal protection. Professor Tischler founded the Animal Legal Defense Fund in 1979, the first nonprofit dedicated to protecting animals through the law. Professor Tischler worked as ALDF's executive director for 25 years and as general counsel until her retirement in spring 2019. There, she conceived of and litigated cutting edge cases aimed at protecting the interests of animals. Professor Tischler paved the way through a legal system that routinely ignored the interests of animals. Professor Tischler's deep experience and shaping of the field of animal law is detailed in her two-part article, A Brief History of Animal Law, Part 1 and Part 2, published in the Stanford Journal of Animal Law and Policy. 
Professor Tischler is currently co-authoring a casebook on industrial animal agriculture law and policy. The book, a first of its kind, will provide a comprehensive overview of concentrated animal feed operations and the animal welfare, environmental, worker justice, and other social justice issues impacted by industrialized animal agriculture in the United States and beyond. So everyone, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Professor Joyce Tischler. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen right from the start. Hang on a sec. And there we go. Okay, good morning. One of the things I'm enjoying, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> about getting older is that a lot of the chatter that was in my brain has fallen away. You know, the chatter, 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 chatter. Uh, the doubts, the worries, the second guessing uh, that defined my younger years. Moving past the chatter has freed me up to focus on what I think is really important. I, I don't mean to sound like I'm boasting, but I think I've lived the life I was supposed to live and I've done the work I was supposed to do. And I'm still doing that work. And no, I didn't listen to my parents. I didn't get a job with, with a large prestigious law firm. I never married a doctor. Uh, I didn't get rich or famous. And truth be told, I never made it past five feet in height. But I feel really lucky. Uh, I followed this little voice inside my head that told me to use my law degree to work for non-human animals. I know a lot of lawyers who earn a good living or in prestigious positions, but it's just a job to them. They don't really care about their work the way I care about mine. I'm passionate about the work I do, and I've been able to spend over 40 years putting my beliefs and values into action. So I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, a little early for me, <clears throat> I thought I'd give you a preview um, of what you're going to do and who you're going to do it for and why you're going to do it. Uh, if you're already learning about the problems of animals that the animals experience, you're well on your way. And you're gaining, unfortunately, what, what the author Carol Adams calls traumatic knowledge. Knowledge about how bad it is for them. Knowledge that darkens your soul. So what I'm gonna do in this few minutes we have together is to show you pictures of beautiful healthy animals, the way they're supposed to be. So I want you to enjoy the slides and understand that these are your de facto clients. As you look at these beautiful animals, I want to share a concept with you. It's called tikkun olam, which means the world is broken and it's our job to repair it. I mend the world by working for non-human animals. I speak for them because they cannot speak for themselves. This concept encourages us to stretch our hearts and embrace more of this world, to stand beside the wounded and the defenseless, to embrace those who suffer, to acknowledge and reach out to those who are ignored, exploited, and abused. And this is not just a religious or a feel-good or a political agenda. It's the central meaning of our lives. The world and all of its inhabitants need more generosity, more mercy and better care. Discovering how to mend the world is a profoundly important task. When I stand in solidarity with all life, my experience of living changes. I'm no longer concerned with only taking care of me and mine. That's a myopic view of life. Tikkun olam means recognizing that the well-being of those with whom I share this planet, all beings, is also my own. When I look into the eyes of other animals, I see my own. Whatever situation may come before me, I will try to do no harm, but more importantly, I will work to relieve suffering and to offer care, respect, and protection. This is the ethical basis for all social movements, you know. So how does this relate to you? You who are studying law and working to protect animals. Well, that's pretty easy to figure out. We know this world is unjust. It's an unfair place for non-human animals. This world causes them pain and uses them as if their needs and their interests don't matter. Most human beings 
seem to believe that humanity is far superior to all other species. The ultimate evolution of life on this planet, that's us. Now, I'm fond of human beings, I really am, but we know that humans are not alone in their ability to feel pain and have a sense of their own life. We know that dogs and cats and cows and pigs and chimpanzees, in fact, all of the more complex beings have a central nervous system that is much like our own. They suffer, they feel both physical and emotional pain. They feel joy and pleasure, and they form close familial relationships with members of their own species. And when members of their family die, they grieve. They show that they have emotions and preferences, they communicate their needs, and sometimes they even show a sense of humor. We've been raised in a society that has a rather schizophrenic relationship with animals. We love dogs and cats. We spend billions of dollars on pet food and toys and beddings and veterinary care. And yet too often, too many humans abuse, harm, and exploit even those family members. But a much greater long-term suffering happens in commercial or institutional settings, research labs, puppy mills, circuses, rodeos, and even zoos. My focus for the past decade has been on industrial animal agriculture, uh, what some people call factory farms, but I don't like to use the word farm because this industry has nothing to do with farming. Each year, billions of animals are raised for food, not these two. That's Deja and that's River. Most of those animals are forced to live in intensive confinement. They can barely move or turn around. They can't socialize with others of their own kind as they normally would. They can't do anything that is natural to them, in fact. Broiler chickens have been bred to grow so fast that their skeletons can't support their growth. Their legs break. Dairy cows have been bred to produce so much milk, far more milk than their bodies can tolerate, and they break down. They live out their lives in a persistent state of suffering, physical pain, frustration because their most basic needs are being ignored. They're treated as if they're machines. The problem is they're not machines, they're living beings. Many of them die before they even reach the slaughterhouse because their deaths are simply a cost of doing business to the industry. And all of this suffering happens because most people consider these sentient beings as lives that don't really matter except when they're food or fur or shoes. Otherwise, they're not important enough for us to be informed, much less concerned about their pain. But their suffering does matter. It's important to the individual who experiences it, whether that individual is an elephant, a bird, an octopus, a cow. In the spirit of tikkun olam, that suffering is important to you and me. The world is broken, and it's our job to repair it. Suffering matters, we don't look away. You get that, I don't have to explain that to you. It's like we've got some eerie sixth sense, the ability to hear and see the suffering of non-human beings. And we wanna take action to bring that suffering to a halt, to allow those beings to live their lives in peace and dignity surrounded by their kin, like the animals in these pictures. And I know how it feels to finally meet humans who think the way we do. Many of the people closest to us will never be able to hear or see what we do. But what has changed in my lifetime is that now those people respect the fact that we can hear and see those voices. They may not be willing to take our path, but on some level they understand that we're serving a higher purpose. Harriet Beecher Stowe once wrote, it's the matter of taking the side of the weak against the strong something the best people have always done. Somebody has to stand up for the animals. Somebody has to speak for them and fight for what is right because they matter. Their pain matters. Their interests matter. I've learned that my place in this world is to help human beings open their hearts and their minds to the widespread suffering that is inflicted upon animals. My task is to help them support an end to that suffering. My career and the work that we do with the Center for Animal Law Studies and in the animal law movement is a reflection of our understanding of tikkun olam, our duty 
to mend the world. We use our legal skills to protect animals precisely because most people choose to ignore their suffering. And we know that as much as we could correct, I'm sorry, we know that as much as we wish we could correct all the wrongs quickly, the, the reality is that we have a long road ahead of us and much hard work to do. So many animals are abused, exploited, terrorized, and in pain. I caution each of us to ask ourselves some questions on a regular basis. One is, how can I get animals out of a persistent state of suffering? How can I help to build a body of law that provides increased protections for animals, that recognizes that they have interests, and that forces our society to consider those interests and balance them against the interests of human beings? And how can I help a legal effort to create rights for animals? Well, that's no small task, as we all know. Building the animal law movement won't just happen. We have to strategically build a movement that is strong and solid and successful so that we can create meaningful change for the animals within the legal system. We must make inroads into a pervasive system that denies even the animals most basic needs. We can't be bystanders. We have to start somewhere. And this is probably gonna sound weird, but. It doesn't really matter where you start. Pick an issue, pick a species, pick whatever you are passionate about, roll up your sleeves and take action. I may seem confident to you now, but believe me, I was not born knowing that someday I'd be called the mother of animal law. I spent my early 20s confused and miserable. And if I had known how hard it was going to be to start a movement, I might not have tried. I didn't get hired to be the first executive director of ALDF because I beat out a large group of qualified applicants. There were no other applicants. No one wanted my job. It wasn't because there was a bad economy or a good economy. There was no economy. No one wanted that prestigious job because I had to raise the money to pay my own salary. No one else was willing to do that. We got a grant from the Animal Protection Institute, and that gave us $6,000. We had no office, no equipment, no support, no clear idea of where and how to raise money to pay my salary and to do our work. I say that not to point out how brave I am, because I'm really not very brave. I'm really quite ordinary. I say it because the externalities didn't matter. We found a way to do what we had to do because we had to. The animals needed lawyers. Tikkun olam, okay? No turning back, no giving up. Failure, not an option. I've learned that we mold ourselves by facing difficult choices, by dealing with adversity. All of those seemingly scary choices that we are forced to make are necessary. They help us to learn who we are and how far we can go. So I hope the takeaway from this talk is don't focus on the economy, don't focus on the pandemic, don't focus on whether there are enough jobs for animal lawyers, don't focus on your nagging sense of inadequacy, focus on the animals, focus on tikkun olam. You are doing important work right now. You are building your capacity to serve animals and mend the world. The classes you're taking are teaching you what you need to know. You're exploring the resources that are available to you. The first generation of animal lawyers has given you a very sound foundation. There are books being published. You have law journals that will help you develop your ideas and you can use your input in any of those. Um, clerkships, fellowships, where you can hone your legal skills. You have student support groups. You have Kelly Lavenda and Priscilla Rader of ALDF and the other staff there. The Center for Animal Law Studies, even if you don't go, all of these are resources that you can use. And this symposium, this is for you, savor it. Keep attending webinars and symposia, animal law conferences, and get out of your comfort zone and network with everyone you can, whether it's online, by phone, or in person, because that's going to re-energize you, and it's going to give you more tools for your toolbox. 
And don't be afraid to reach out to those of us who have been living this life for 10, 20, 30, in my case, 43 years. Each of us found a way to do the work somehow. And we didn't know what our paths would be or what our careers would look like until they started to take shape. Pick our brains, take advantage of what we've learned. Use it to make yourself the best possible advocate for the animals. And one thing more that I'd like to mention because you may not have considered this yet. Understand that the work you do to protect animals is going to transform you. It's going to make you into the person you were meant to be. I'm not puffing, that's not something I made up to make you feel better. It's something I've learned because I've witnessed it happen to so many of my colleagues and myself. This work will mold you into the person you were meant to be. Who's that person? No, I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. You're gonna, you're gonna figure that out. Um, I hope that you will hang on to hope, right? Keep it safely tucked in your pocket to remind you that there's gonna be a better day for the animals and that you're gonna be part of the reason for that progress. There's a well-known saying from an ancient rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, and that's, if I'm not for myself, then who is for me? If I'm only for myself, then what am I? And if not, when? If not now, when? I'd like to paraphrase that. If I'm not here for the animals, then who will be here for them? And if not now, then when? I want to thank the planners of the symposium for asking me to talk. I want to thank you for being here, for showing up for the animals. Listen, if you weren't studying animal law, Steve Wise and David Faber and I would be sitting in a corner somewhere with our heads in our hands and we'd be asking ourselves, what happened? It was a good idea. Why didn't anybody follow? Why didn't they catch on? But more importantly, who's gonna be here for the animals after we're gone? We don't have to feel that way because the future of animal law is bright. It's here right now. You are it, you are our future. You're gonna continue the work we started. You carry the spirit of tikkun olam. You have opened your eyes to see the needs of the animals. You've opened your ears, you've heard their cries. You've opened your hearts to their pain. You are learning where help is needed and how to provide it. And you're allowing yourself to be of use to mend the world. So let's make a pact, okay? Against all odds, we are going to change the world and make it a far better place for the animals. Namaste to you all, and thank you for listening. And now, on to your first panel.